Hello, I'm Bernie Hayes. Today's guest is Vivian Gibson. She's the author of The Last Children of Mill Creek, today on The Bernie Hayes Show. I'm Bernie Hayes. My guest is Vivian Gibson. It's Gibson Hoyle. Hi, how are you? Good I'm morning. good, doing great, and thank you for coming. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. Oh, your book is a talk of the town. It's just also really the talk of the nation. Wow. You know, and Amazon got wonderful reviews. Every book, the review that I've seen on it is just, just, just tremendous. What made you, well, tell us about The Last Children of Mill Creek. Why is, what is this a book? What's it about? Well, The Last Children of Mill Creek is about my memories as one of the actual last children of a community that has been erased, mm -hmm. a segregated black community in the heart of downtown St. Louis. Um, it was a black community from around the turn of the century uh, in St. Louis until 1959 when it was demolished mm -hmm. to um, build Highway 6440. So mm -hmm. it... Uh, is that story of all these black people who lived there, who uh, strived and worked and educated their children, many of them coming from um, the South and mm -hmm. the great migration North to uh, live in St. Louis and have a better life. Um, when the highway funding came, became available from the federal government, uh, 465 acres of black people in a segregated community, sure. which meant we couldn't live anywhere else, uh, had to be displaced. And so over a period of a, probably about five years, uh, the city had to figure out where we would go. That's the story of so many other cities. I mean, urban renewal, they call it. Urban renewal. Or Negro removal. Yes. That's what it was. That's now, right. Mill Creek, for those who do not know, uh, Union Station is located in the Mill Creek area. Union Station mm -hmm. is, is pretty much considered the easternmost boundary. Okay. The western boundary of the urban renewal portion of Mill Creek, which mm -hmm. was the heart of Mill Creek, uh, goes from Grand, which is where St. Louis University is today, yes. okay. uh, along Lindo, which turns then into Olive, right. goes down to... Um, 20th Street, which is where Union Station is, goes over to the railroad tracks, mm -hmm. uh, back up either Shoto or the railroad tracks to uh, Grand again. And so that's 465 acres. However, the highway is only about a half mile wide strip that sure. goes along those railroad tracks. But they demolished all of those homes uh, that went from uh, the railroad tracks over to Olive uh, up to Grand and 20th Street, and really didn't have a plan for that land other than to put that one strip in. They just wanted to get rid of those black people that sure. were there. And break up that voting block. And break up that voting block, mm -hmm. that community. Sure. It was a community. Mm -hmm. And I am reluctant to say anything positive about segregation, but what it did was create a support system for all of those black people. Uh, in that community, and we've never had that kind of culture and community in St. Louis since that time. How important do you think Mill Creek was to the country? To the country, there were a lot of important people who came out of that community. Mm -hmm. um, the only high school there was Vishon High School, and it was built in 1927 mm -hmm. for those children of Mill Creek. Uh, before that, the only school for black children was Sumner High School. Mm -hmm. But there was such an influx uh, in that migration north uh, that they had to build a second high school. And uh, Elston Howard, uh, so many people came out of that community uh, and that high school, uh, politicians, artists, uh, activists, lots of activists. Sure. Yeah. So when poor Southerners rural people come into this, came into St. Louis, even many of them then went to the Ville, but almost all of them came through uh, Mill Creek. I remember my, I was headed to 
Zanzibar, Louisiana, 1956 to be a disc jockey. And I stopped in St. Louis and mm -hmm. through Union Station. Mm -hmm. And uh, I always remember this this restaurant. It was called Crown Restaurant. The Crown Restaurant you had know? the best cornbread I've ever <laughs> had. <laughs> and then, and then you, you gave me a gift. You brought a gift to me. Yeah. It's called The Last Children of Mill Creek. And uh, on the back of it is a daddy's pot liquor. <laughs> It says a flavorful and nutritious broth simmered with smoked pork, salt, pepper, vinegar, and the tangy tart flavor of slow cooked turnip, mustard, or collard greens. How did that come about? Well, my father was a hardworking man. Um, he worked two jobs. There were eight children in our family. My, my father worked two jobs. My mother was a stay-at-home artist and craftsperson. Um, and my father would go to work at 5 o'clock in the morning, get home at 5 o'clock in the evening, sit in front of the TV with a TV tray, watch sure. the news, eat his dinner, and a half hour later go to his second job. And he didn't get home until about 10 o'clock at night from the second job, which was a janitor at our church. Mm -hmm. uh, and by the time my father got home, most of the time what was left was the pot liquor. Pot liquor, yeah. And he would crumble cornbread into that pot liquor, eat it, go to bed, and wake up five hours later and go to uh, his job again and start that over. And so he loved pot liquor, uh, and so I thought it was just apropos to give everybody that recipe. That is so very nice. We have about four minutes left in this segment. Could you read a few passages from the book for us? Yeah, I'd like to read you the, uh, a story called Sun Up to Sundown, and it's the story that the publisher got uh, uh, that get, when I got the uh, publishing contract. Okay. Many of the women on Bernard Street, including my grandmother, left home before daylight to catch as many as three streetcars that transported them to manicured communities just west of the city limits. They arrived early to homes where they cooked and served scrambled eggs for breakfast and readied white children for school. The rest of their day was spent cooking, cleaning, and doing laundry until boarding streetcars in the evening to return home, just in time to go to bed. Grandmama said that there were sundown laws that mandated people of color to be off the streets in the county at, by sunset. If she had to work late, her white folks, that's how she referred to her employers, would drive her to the Wellston Loop to catch an eastbound streetcar back to the city. Grandmother, my grandmother was in bed by 7.30, which was our time to be quiet. A slammed front door, a burst of laughter, or the ryth rhythmic thumps of Sam Cooke singing, Another Saturday night, and I ain't got nobody on the radio, would elicit familiar rapping on her bedroom floor, where there was a broomstick leaning against the wall for an arm's length away just for the purpose of pounding a signal of silence. Sometimes, out of frustration, she would shuffle in her well-worn bedroom slippers to the top of the stairs and call down to my mother in a commanding tone made no less threatening by her shaky, weary voice. Francis, make those children be quiet. The space that divided my grandmother's quietness from our constant hum of an, of, had another appeal for me. It was my opportunity to eavesdrop on my grandmother's cloistered existence just feet away. There was always a low murmur from her brown molded plastic zenith radio that sat on a crowded table just inside her bedroom door. The black rotary telephone that took up most of the remaining place on the small table rarely rang in the evenings, but when it did ring, I leaned in and pressed my face against the upright wooden balusters and positioned an ear to hear what was said. Wow, the last children of Mill Creek, Vivian Gibson. These are your memories. Yes. Oh, they're so wonderful, and I'm sure, I mean, the whole book. I'm gonna, the next segment, I want to come back and ask you to read some more from another passage, okay? Okay. 
And we're at the New Life Evangelistic Center, 2428, what's enrolled in Oakland, Missouri. And we'll be right back after this. You may be facing a wide range of problems of all different sizes, shapes, colors, and, and you just feel like you're totally pressed from every direction at this particular moment. I would encourage you to pick up your Bible. It's a sharp two-edged sword that God wants to use to help you to know that you are more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus who strengthens you. It's a sharp two-edged sword. On the one side, you'll learn to praise God and trust Him in the midst of your own personal needs. On the other side, you'll see the need for social justice. You'll see the need to feed the hungry, to help the homeless, to help the downtrodden. It's a sharp two-edged sword. So yes, we need to be personally strengthened as we read the Word of God, as we begin to pray, as we trust God in the, in our midst of our own personal needs. But the other side of that sword is that we uh, be motivated to really help those who are in need. Now, if we try to help people that are in need over and over, that's great. But if we do it out of our own strength, we're going to get tired out, burned out, worn out. Take it from someone who's been at it for 50 one years. How can I keep going day after day? By finding new strength in our resurrected Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, reading the Word of God, walking in the midst of God's creation where there's so much variety and praising Him in spite of all the trials and tribulations. Because no matter how high the problem may be or no matter how low it goes, for example, Romans chapter 8. Yes, it starts out in verse 1, there's no condemnation, it ends that there's no separation, no separation from the love of God. That no matter how high we go, no matter how low we go, no matter how far or wide we go, God's love is there. Move forth in the love of God, experience the power of God, let the Spirit of God show you needs where you can be an answer to someone's prayer who's crying out to the Lord at this particular moment. They may be homeless, they may be hungry, they may have a personal need, they may be lonely, but you can be God's instrument to bring hope and help to so many people that are suffering at this particular time. Yes, the Word of God works. Faith works. Let's experience it. Let's live it. When you partner with New Life Evangelistic Center, you impact so many people. The economy in this country is really hurting so many all over. And we're seeing the number of people who are experiencing homelessness rise. You can make a difference today by giving your gift online at newlifeevangelisticcenter.org newlifeevangelisticcenter.org. Make a real big change in the lives of so many. And welcome back. Vivian Gibson is my guest, and she's the author of The Last Children of Mill Creek. Uh, Ms. Gibson, what was your inspiration for writing the book? Well, it's hard to say because I, I don't think the book started off as a book initially. It mm -hmm. was simply writing stories, writing my memories for my children. My parents died before my children were born, and it was an effort after I retired, one, to just be able to do what I wanted to do, sure. but secondly, just to record these memories for my children to have a sense of what my life was like, uh, to introduce them in personal stories to my parents. It was only when some of my stories got out to uh, a publisher that that publisher approached me and told me, these are good stories, people want to hear this. And uh, we started negotiating a book contract. Well, tell us about Vivian Gibson. Well, Vivian Gibson is uh, a, a person who's just about enjoyed every second of my life. I, uh, had, I, I went to school, I went to Vashon High School, graduated from, uh, High school in 1968. Uh, I was Miss Vachon of 1968. Oh, wow. And uh, I went off to a college. I went to uh, the Fashion Institute of Technology in New York City, lived there for 10 years, married, and um, my husband and I, with my young baby, uh, went to live in Liberia, West Africa. I was there for a coup. The first coup that wow. happened in, in Liberia, we had to escape, and I've just written a story about that called 20 Minutes Notice, where we had 20 minutes notice to get out of the country. Um, so that's part of maybe the next book. Sure. Um, so I've just had businesses. I've, I'm an, a serial entrepreneur. I enjoy just doing 
what makes me happy, and writing this book was one of those things. I understand cooking is one of your fun. Cooking is <laughs> one of, <laughs> I've had catering businesses, mm -hmm. I've had a, a line of hot sauces and seasonings. Um, so I'm one of those people when you say, oh, you ought to sell that, and I go, okay. <laughs> so uh, I am now retired. This book has changed my life. I spend a lot of time doing these kinds of things, talking about this book, talking to students, which I, I thoroughly enjoy, just getting the story of this erased community out to new students and hoping that they will learn uh, what has happened to uh, communities like ours that have been erased all over the country, and maybe when they're in charge, uh, they'll handle things differently. Okay. Now, Harris Stowe State University, mm -hmm. that's the old Vashant High School. Did you that's attend right. it? Yeah. yeah. I attended, I didn't attend that building. My okay. father did and okay. my oldest sister sure. because they were still living in Mill Creek at the time. Mm -hmm. I'm, I went to the Vashon. that's the second iteration okay. of Vashon. Mm -hmm. You know there's been three. Sure. Mm -hmm. So I attended yeah. Vashon at Grand and Bell. Okay. This is wonderful. This is good. so good to know. Could you just read a little bit more of the book, The Last Children of Mill Creek? <clears throat> Well, this, this story is called The Cat, and it really has to do with the fact that we were segregated in this, this poorly maintained community. And um, so this gives you a sense of, of how we lived and how we survived. And after you finish that, we want to know how we can get the book. Okay, great. Okay. The Cat. That's what we call the mottled gray muscular tabby that roamed the perimeters of our cold water two-family dwelling we called home. It strode, brushing against the fences between the yards and the back alley, like a predator, methodically patrolling its territory. I always knew it was there, but I didn't look directly at it. We never thought of the cat as a family pet. It was utilitarian, practical, like a farm animal. Its purpose was to control the rats. We didn't name it or touch it. We didn't feed it. Mama must have given it water and scraps during the day, which accounts for its loyalty to our house. All we wanted was for the cat to hunt rats at night. In late fall and winter, the rats came inside at night. Daddy and the boys plugged holes with steel wool, held in place with chicken wire, and hammered flattened tin cans in corners, where the floor and the baseboards met. Huge, powerful rat traps had permanent positions in the stone wall basement where my brother slept in the summer. On a brisk November evening, my brother Honey and I were sitting on the back steps waiting for the last light of day to fade before we had to go in for the night. The cat slowly emerged from behind the coal shed at the far end of the backyard and paused, as if to indicate it was her yard now. Honey glanced up and while rising from the step, confessed to an unasked query. I'm more afraid of the cats than the rats, especially at night when they sound like babies crying in the alley. I was reassured to hear that it was cats I heard at night and not babies. As if egged on by the cat's appearance, we entered our dimly lit kitchen and closed the door behind us. I slept every night with my clunky brown school shoes held snug against my chest. Other six-year-old girls might have been snuggled up with a rosy-cheeked doll on a soft pile of a well-loved teddy bear. Not me. I didn't even like dolls and teddy bears. My shoes were my security against the threat of the mostly unseen nighttime rats that scurried across the floor and gnawed at something within the walls next to my bed. You know, this could be the story of a family in Chicago, yeah. Detroit, yeah. Philadelphia, Harlem. Mm -hmm. This is unbelievable. I mean, that, I'm sure if one, whoever re reads the book are going to relate to the memories that, that, that you've shared in this instance. This is yeah. a wonderful version of, of, of your life. Well, how can we get the book? 
Well, you can buy the book at any bookstore, I'm very happy to say. Okay. You can buy it on Amazon. All the local independent bookstores have, have the book. Uh, you can go to my website, which is vivian-gibson.com, and order it through there. Through is that there. correct? Vivian That's correct. That's correct. vivian-gibson.com. That's wonderful. Um, okay. And I'm really pleased that the book is doing so well. I wrote it three years ago, and it's still selling like crazy. It's, it's like a brand new book to so many people. I know. You know, and uh, I, I was uh, in the office uh, of uh, Dr. Aline Phillips at, at Harris State University, mm -hmm. and she had three copies of the book. Yeah. <laughs> right, was just sitting there in front of me on my desk. I said, yeah, that's, they, that's they uh, bought a bunch of the books uh, a yeah. few months ago for students in, in certain classes mm -hmm. to, to read, and so yeah, I'm happy that, yeah. that students are reading this And book. you met with the president recently, I understand. Yeah, I yep, I met with the president, and we're going to do a special commemoration uh, of uh, Bashan High School and its association and its location in Mill Creek to get the students at Harris Stowe State University more aware of the place that they're in, this space. Mm -hmm. And the people around the country and around the world who read the book, what do you hope they get from it? This story is universal. This story certainly mm -hmm. is <clears throat> national in terms of people of color and their communities being displaced for highways and, and so-called progress in urban centers. So this is not just a St. Louis book. This mm -hmm. book has... Uh, Meaning for everyone. Yeah. Certainly. Yeah, certainly okay. does. And we'll be right back with uh, Vivian Gibson. We're at the New Life Evangelist Center 24, 28 Woodson Road in Overland, Missouri. And I'm Bernie Hayes, and we'll be right back after this. The Bernie Hayes program is uh, produced at NLEC TV at, right here at 2428 Woodson Road in Overland, Missouri. It's our new headquarters since they closed the 1411 Locust building. We're working to get back into that building. In addition to that, trying to help so many people through a wide variety of safe houses, training programs, transportation assistance, so many ways people are getting help because of all of you that are supporting the Work of New Life Evangelistic Center. Now, if you'll send a gift of $25 or more, we want to send you this special, the Bernie Hayes Show Cup. And we're giving that to people. It's just a way of saying thank you. So when you send your gift, request a cup. We'll be happy to get it off to you. It's New Life Evangelistic Center, P.O. Box 473, St. Louis, Missouri. That's 63166. You can give online at nlecstl.org. Now I'm really asking all of you to join us in praying. The needs are so phenomenal at this particular time. So many hurting and homeless people are contacting us daily, but we're able to help them because of each one of you that are praying, caring, and sharing at this time. Tell your families and friends about NLEC TV and get directly involved yourself. Today's subject, Professor Mia Bay. She's a Roy F. and Jeanette F. Nichols Professor of American History at the University of Pennsylvania. Prior to arriving at Penn, Bay worked at Rutgers University, where she was a professor of history and the director of the Rutgers Center for Race and Ethnicity. Professor Bay is a scholar of American and African-American intellectual, cultural, and social history, whose recent interests include black women's rights and thoughts, African-American approaches to citizenship, and the history of race and transportation. She holds a PhD from Yale University and a BA from the University of Toronto. Bay's publication include The White Image in the Black Mind, African-American Ideas About White People, To Tell the Truth Freely, and A Life of Ida B. Wells. Bay's current projects include a new book entitled Traveling Black, A Social History of Segregated Transportation, and a book on the history of African-Americans and their ideas about Thomas Jefferson. Mia Bay. God loves a cheerful giver. Even though things are really tough right now, you can make a difference in the lives of so many. New Life has been doing this work for 50 years, and we have seen God's gracious goodness through people like you who have participated in this work. There are so many people who are suffering. More people are, are becoming homeless for the first time. Uh, with the rising pro costs of uh, inflation and food and housing and so many other commodities, we need help. You can make a difference today in the lives of so many by giving your tax-deductible gift to P.O. Box 473, St. Louis, Missouri. Or go to New Life Evangelistic Center dot org or call to get involved in this incredible work. 
and welcome back the last children of Mill Creek, Vivian Gibson. Ms. Gibson, is that your picture on the, on the book cover that's, there? That's my picture on the book cover. <laughs> I'm about, uh, probably about seven years old and uh, wearing my favorite Easter dress. <laughs> Where did you live exactly in Mill Creek? I lived at 2649 Bernard Street, which mm -hmm. is between Jefferson and Leffingwell. Right. Now, if you're coming off of Highway 6440 going east, uh, that exit onto Jefferson is just about where our house was. Yeah, where, where um, the bank is, the Wells Fargo, in that area. Well, Wells Fargo is all the way over at Market Street. Mm -hmm. But okay. Market Street and Wells Fargo is a very important intersection mm -hmm. uh, of Mill Creek because the People's Finance Building, which was at that location where Wells Fargo is today, mm -hmm. and it was a black-owned bank lending institution built by black people, even black tradesmen, uh, so that um, the people in Mill, like communities like Mill Creek could get mortgage loans mm -hmm. because the white banks did not give them loans for purchasing their properties or, or, or whatever needs they have. So that location is really key to the memory of Mill Creek. Have you started on your new project yet? Well, I'm, uh, I'm writing a little bit. I'm very mm -hmm. busy s still talking about this book. Three years later, it was mm -hmm. published in 2020. It could have been published three months ago because it is just selling like crazy, and people are so interested, and I'm talking. But now I'm writing about the next, say, 20 or 30 years sure. after. This book ends when I'm 27 years old. The children who read the book, the young people who read the book, and people in their 20s and early 30s, yeah. what are they getting from it? They're getting a real picture of the humanity of the people who lived in this community, how we supported each other, how we survived behind what W.E.B. Du Bois called the veil, what was happening behind the uh, walls and the streets of these segregated communities, how people thrived, how they supported each other, how they educated their children. There were 43 churches in Mill Creek. Wow. And now there's only one of those churches left that wasn't demolished. So they'll learn what our lives were like and how we um, thrived. Mm -hmm. And survived. And survived. Yes. So once again, how can we get the book? You can get the book anywhere, uh, I'm happy to say. Uh, you can certainly buy it online through a Amazon, but any independent bookstore, and you can buy it from my website, which is vivian-gibson.com. So Progressive Emporium, West, Book, uh, West Bank Books, and all those. I see me, okay. uh, I see Left Bank Books, yes. Yeah. Okay. So that's Barnes & Noble. Yeah, okay. Yes. But this is wonderful. Uh, I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate not only you coming by and reading some passages from The Last Children of Mill Creek, but also for the gift that you brought me. <laughs> so I'll help you have your picture with me. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> the Last Children of Mill Creek. How did you um, come about with the, just the title? The title came about much later uh, in the book when I was talking to a friend who, a neighbor who told me she was one of the last children on our block. And she told me a story about, <clears throat> excuse me, when school started, when before there was always this big group of kids walking to school, how she was had to walk to school by herself. She was the last one on our block. And that made me think there were lots of last kids on blocks who were the last to get out of, of that community before it was demolished. So I thought that was just very apropos. And you were one of the last children. I family. was one of the last children, but you'd be surprised how many people said, I was the last one. Yeah. I'm going, I'm going okay, you, children. Is there a union coming? Uh, I don't know. Maybe, <laughs> because there has been a lot of new talk about that time. Mm -hmm. I'm 74 years old, and I was one of the younger children. So a lot of the people who were children at that time are in their 80s and even 90s. So... I don't know. We better get that reunion together soon. Thank you so very much for being my guest today. Thank you, Bernie. And thank you all for visiting us and supporting Reverend Larry Rice and the New Life Evangelistic Center. Until next time, have a great day. Stay safe. I'm Bernie Hayes. Mm -hmm.